excited that you're here? Oh, you can do better than that. Are you excited that you're here? Yes. <sighs> it's time to wake up. I actually am so grateful to be here, and I will confess why. Besides being with people I love and people I've known for over nine years now, from Montreal, famous Montreal, I also feel like I'm on vacation because I just have to do one service and that service is at 11 o'clock. <laughs> Where at Portland and Elgin, I have to do 9.15 and then at 11 o'clock. So thank you so much for trusting God and trusting me to invite me to be with you. I have a tradition and one of my traditions is when I go to somebody's house, I bring them a little gift. And if someone comes to our place for the first time, they receive a little gift from us. So you all gonna have to come by at our house one day. But before going anywhere, I wanna say this house, this building, it's a simple building with wood, glass, iron, whatever else is made of. But because you gather in this place, you make this place, a sacred space, a peaceful space. So I want to share with you my heritage and I want to give you a little, little cross that is from Armenia. See, my heritage is Armenia, uh, Armenian. And these crosses that I wear all the time as well, it's called Khachkar, which means the cross found in the rock. And if you ever get the chance to go visit Armenia, which I'm hoping to do next year when I take a sabbatical, that I will go see all these crosses that are engraved in big rocks in the wilderness and where the very first nation who proclaimed Christianity, the Armenians in 301, have lived and survived through leaving little signs of crosses in the rocks. So this, I urge you, if possible, maybe to add it on you, next to your world candle and have the Armenian cross sit there in memory of celebration of this day. What a great day. 122 years, 1716 years of Armenian Christianity. 2,000 plus years of Jesus, the following of the new way of living for God. Today our gospel reading comes from the gospel of Matthew, chapter 18, verses 21 to 35. If you follow the weekly lectionary, these calls to discipleship are becoming a little bit harder and harder to do. You know, it's like you start in kindergarten playing around and making, you know, playing with dough and stuff. What is that called? Play-doh. Play yeah, playing with dough, play-doh. Play-doh. Yeah, my voice is very strong, eh, Jim? <laughs> um, so, you know, from the beginning of school years, we begin with playing with stuff, making crafts, and then as you go into Masters of uh, Divinity and to uh, PhD degree, things become a little bit, you know, harder and harder. And I do believe that the gospel readings are becoming a little bit harder and harder because Jesus is telling us, hey, you're maturing in this. Listen to what I have to say. So this is the passage. Then Peter came and said to him, him being Jesus, Lord, if another member of the church sins against me, how often should I forgive? As many as seven times? Jesus said to him, not seven times, but I tell you, 77 times. For this reason, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his slaves. 
when he began the reckoning, one who owed him 10,000 talents was brought to him, and as he could not pay, his Lord ordered him to be sold together with his wife and children and all his possessions and payment to be made. So the slave fell on his knees before him saying, have patience with me and I will pay you everything. Out of pity of him, the Lord of that slave released him and forgave him the debt. But that same slave as he went out came upon one of his fellow slaves who owed him a hundred denarii. And seizing him by the throat, he said, pay what you owe. Then his fellow slave fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. But he refused. Then he went and threw him into prison until he would pay the debt. When his fellow slaves saw what had happened, they were greatly distressed and they went and reported to their Lord all that had taken place. Then his Lord summoned him and said to him, you wicked slave. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. Should you not have had mercy on your fellow slave as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his Lord handed him over to be tortured until he would pay his entire debt. So my heavenly father, will also do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother or sister from your heart. May the Spirit add understanding to this reading. Let us pray. God of grace and mercy, may the words of my mouth not only be acceptable in front of you, but fill us with wisdom from your spirit and transform us to transform this world. Amen. We all know forgiveness is one of the hardest things to do in life. I don't know if you've never had trouble forgiving someone else, you're a special person. And I believe the person throughout history who knows what this means is Jesus. Imagine Jesus going from town to town and loving, preaching, feeding and teaching and all around him and all he gets is a few people who love him, many who cannot understand him and a few who just want to kill him. This man, Jesus, knows what it means to forgive. Do you recall on that Friday evening when he was on the cross, what did he pray? He prayed for those who crucified him and said, Father, forgive them as they do not know what they are doing. Friends, today the narrative tells us that Peter comes to Jesus and says, so how many times should I forgive someone who hurts me? Is seven times acceptable? Maybe that's one forgiveness per day that makes a whole week, right? And Jesus says in this translation that you heard, 77 times. In other translations, it actually reads seven times seven. That's, that makes how many? 49, right? All right, see my kindergarten, my elementary classes are helping. Seven or in another translation, it says 70 times seven, which is, whoa, so much bigger. No matter what translation we read, more than one time is the forgiveness protocol. 
Because we ourselves know how hard it is to forgive, even that one time sometimes, it's so hard. Sometimes I meet people who tell me that they haven't spoken to their family members for over 10 years, 20 years, and for the life of them, they don't remember why. What was the reason that they got angry <laughs> at each other? I don't know about you, but I always remember things better if I associated with something else. And here, as usual, Jesus must have been hanging out with people like me because he needed to explain to people in examples and parables are that. Parables are everyday simple stories with dramatic punchlines that allows the hearer to learn a lesson. The story has a huge contrast on purpose. You see the slave, the number one slave, that owed the king, he owed, are you ready for this, 150,000 years of labor. That's how much was his debt in the parable. And the king forgave him. The slave number two, that old slave number one, was only 100 days worth of labor. Can you see the difference? 150,000 years versus 100 days. We're celebrating 122 anniversary of this church. This man who was forgiven 150,000 labor years does not forgive 100 days worth of debt. And hands slave number two who owes him money into punishment, imprisonment until he pays. Well, my logic says, if you put someone in prison, how are they supposed to work and pay you? But that's another story. Friends, forgiveness does not come naturally. And we all know that. I know that. But I believe when Jesus is teaching with this parable, he is saying, when we have experienced forgiveness through the grace of God, then we have to do the same. One of my favorite authors, theologians, who was killed by the Nazis back in World War II, Dietrich Bonhoeffer said, grace is free, but not cheap. Because grace we receive, we need to do the same. I'm not sure when was the last time you had to forgive someone for hurting you directly or even indirectly. I do not think Jesus is asking us to forgive like God forgives, but to forgive like we have been forgiven. We just prayed the Lord's Prayer. What do we say in there? Forgive us as we forgive others. What Jesus is saying and calling the disciples and everyone who wants to follow on this new path, on this new way of living, is to be mirrors of God's love. You know, we live in a gorgeous area here, and I, am, I feel so blessed every day that I live in Portland and just around the corner. No, I don't have a house on the lake, but it's around the corner, about 0.7 kilometers, and I can go and look at the beautiful Big Greedo Lake, and every time I see the gorgeous lake being calm, and the reflection of the sky and the nature of the trees just reflecting in that lake, I always think of God's love is being reflected in this calm lake. And I'm reminded of be still and know that I am God, as the psalmist says. And we are called to be still 
and allow the love of God to reflect through us. You see, the first slave was the, with the big debt, who was forgiven, did not even realize how he was forgiven because he was just rushing through his life and living a chaotic life. If he had taken time to slow down and just be, I think he would have realized the enormity of his forgiveness. This year, 2017, marks the 500th anniversary of the Reformation. On October 31, 1517, a German monk posted 95 thesis statements on the door of, on the gate, at the gates of the All Saints Church in Wittenberg, and his name was Martin Luther. He expressed in his thesis how righteousness was not God's expectation of us, but it was a gift from God. And I'm going to add on Martin's idea and said, it is a gift that we are given and we are called to share that gift with others. Luther freed himself freed himself from the oppression of the fear and the punishment that the church kept on preaching at that time. Luther called the churches to reform and transform themselves, to be the lighthouses where God's love and forgiveness is spread to all, and live a life of mercy and grace as we ourselves have received it. Beloved, when Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself, for me that means I need to love others as God has loved me in the same level. Today, on this beautiful summer day in September, on this 122nd anniversary, of your church, of your lighthouse that is there to spread the love of God, the light of Christ. I believe God is still calling us, calling us to the basics of the way of Jesus. I think we get so hooked up on numbers and how many times we need to forgive oh, I've called you, you've never called me back, and we keep track, and God says, no, no need to keep track. I believe what this lesson is focusing on is that forgiveness is not a commodity to be reckoned with on a calculator or keep track on an Excel sheet Forgiveness cannot be quantified. Forgiveness is not a power game. Forgiveness is to look at ourselves and others in the same light of God. And this light of God does not cost you a dime because you don't have to pay Hydra One for that. We know I know firsthand the church is not perfect. Just last night, my husband Gary and I, we were just having a quiet conversation, him and I and our 12-year-old golden retriever, Duke, who was keeping us company. And our conversation was that so many of us, so many people get hurt from the church. And we concluded, for now, that because the closest people, we feel so comfortable with each other, we hurt one another without realizing that we're hurting one another. In a small community, it is a hard place to be. And sometimes, 
as Jesus calls us to do this all the time, but we let our ego get in the way. And we forget. And we forget that the church is not a competition. My committee is not in competition with your committee. We all do our parts. This finger is not in competition with this finger. They all do their own parts. So I believe Jesus called the church to be a hospital, a hospital where healing and reconciliation is supposed to take place. Unfortunately, on the way of growth, sometimes we hurt others. Sometimes we kill the spirit. The other day I was talking with someone in Montreal area whose mother passed away and who was a very precious woman to me in my life. And I asked her, I said, if you're doing a celebration of life, if you tell me the time, maybe I'll be able to come there. Because this woman always said, hey, Takui, when I die, you're doing my service. I was just getting into school at that time, so it was quite a while ago. So I expressed this to her daughter, and her daughter's response to me was, well, my mother was never a religious person. I'm surprised she said that. And my brother and I are not religious. So like, why would a minister want to come and say something or do something? Religion is life. Life is religion. The meaning of the word religion, I'm not sure if you heard it before, it comes from the Latin root of religio, which means muscles. What keeps your body together? Muscles. What keeps you going? When you run, Aiden, what is the part that you're using the most? It's your muscles. What do doctors say? If you don't walk enough, your muscles will weaken and you will not be able to walk. You need to strengthen those muscles. We need to bring our spiritual life front and center once again and, and, and forget to connect religion as a negative thing because we've given religion a bad rap over the years. Beloved, in conclusion, I want to leave you with this. God's desire the God I know so far in my 49 years is never to punish humanity, but to use God's law, which is love, to be the mirror that brings us knowledge, insight, to do unto others what God has done unto so may this Celebration Sunday be a true Sunday where it will be a historical day of beginning to take baby steps once again to transform us, to transform the church, to transform the world by the grace of God. Thanks be to God in the name of the Creator, Redeemer and the Sustainer, May you continue to live the life the way that Jesus lived. Amen.